Welcome on in, everybody. I am glad to be able to welcome Rocco Miller in from the Bracketeer. Um, obviously, one of the, the better bracketologists in college basketball. He knows he knows every which way of college basketball from the big conferences to the little conferences. Rocco, well, it's great to have you back. Um, we're going to get into some WCC basketball here. Um, just uh, how's it been going? Like, what where are you headed this week? What's what's on your docket? Things have been well, Zach. Always good to be on with you. Um, fired up to be out on the West Coast, uh, back home here today, but leaving tonight to go to Pullman, where I've been several times for football games as a Seattle guy and, and a former, you know, Washington uh, student and all that. But I'm I'm excited to see an Apple Cup in basketball tomorrow night, Washington, Washington State, senior night for the Cougars, historic year. Um, they still have an outside chance of their first Pac-12 championship since 1941, which is just a crazy statistic. Um, Kyle Smith's done a phenomenal job. It's also a future WCC team, uh, so it's probably good for me to get out there a, a little bit ahead of the curve for before next year. And um, and then Monday, uh, I'll be in Vegas, uh, ready for the semifinal, the annual trip. Monday, Tuesday, semifinals, finals. Uh, I'm not sure how long I'll stay in Vegas, Def definitely uh, through part of Wednesday, and that's all I have planned so far. Um, but the, the bracketology and, and all of that work cranks up on Wednesday. So the WCC tournament is just such a perfect sweet spot. There's really not a ton of other action in the rest of the country. The WCC takes center stage. We usually see the same teams every year, so that's a different story. But um, it's great for the league. You get the marquee television spots. and um, and it's it's always good to just kind of be go, doing this every year and seeing the same people down there and uh, fostering those relationships. Yeah, Vegas will be fun. I'll be down there as well for the Monday Tuesday game, so I will right. definitely see you out there. Yes. but let's get into it because like so, what we have seen from the last month and a half or so is just the rise of Gonzaga. It just seems like that this team has just gotten better and better and better. Uh, really, probably since that St. Mary's loss. Uh, back in early back in early February, what is like, as you've kind of been able to watch Gonzaga? Like what what are some of like the big differences you've seen? And as they've kind of climbed through the bracket and as they've become a lock at this point, uh, what 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 are the changes? What's been like some of the things that you've keyed in on? Well, I think the 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 key, at least offensively, they're they're certainly shooting far less threes. Um, they're very they're very much in a mindset of this is what we do well. It took Mark Few, you know, a handful of months to figure out what was going to be the best formula. Of course, took injuries preseason to steal venters and um, other other personnel issues along the way. So one of the challenges they've had is trying to roll with seven guys all year long. A lot of teams get down to seven guys by March, but they've been doing it for uh, quite a while. And so what's going to be the most effective, efficient use of uh, their system and then what's the best way to maximize possessions? I think they've clearly um, gone to a, a much more heavy get the ball to EK uh, approach. You know, Nemhard has been absolutely dynamite in the same areas game, as you know. He had a ridiculous line, 20 points, 10 assists, just one turnover. Um, and I think the other key for the St. Mary's specific matchup was um, I think they took a little bit of a chapter out of last year's championship game. I tweeted that because for the parts of the game I was able to see while I was busy with the meetings in Omaha, um, I noticed a lot a lot of heavy ball pressure disrupting St. Mary's guards, and that's exactly the formula they used to create a, a disaster championship game last year. Again, I, I know they didn't do it, sustain it for as long in, in this particular game in Moraga, but it, I think it contributed to that double-digit lead they gained early. And then that when you can get a double digit lead against St. Mary's, that creates a lot of uh, discomfort for the Gales because they're they're quite frankly not used to being in that position too often, and it takes them out of their comfort zone in a hurry. Um, it's kind of the way it played out a little bit last year, but obviously St. Mary's did a nice job responding uh, to start the second half, and you know got that thing back down to single digits for a little bit. But but man, Gonzaga overall, they are just. <clears throat> Uh, they're, they're shooting the ball very well. They're taking high percentage shots. That's really my main point. And they're finding a way to interchange uh, other personnel. The, they've got the main three of Nemhard, Hickman, and Watson virtually not sitting at all. 
And then the other two spots that can rotate between the other four guys uh, with EK being the, the focal point. Uh, and they get, get in games where they're blowing teams out, they can get EKs a little bit more breathing time to save them for uh, whatever game they got coming up next. So there's, yeah, there's just a lot of little tweaking they've done to maximize these seven guys and just a masterful job by the staff. Yeah, it really does seem. I mean, this this turnaround, and you're right. Like, I think the one big thing has been their their movement away from the reliance on that three point shot. I think we saw earlier in the year uh, what yeah. I think they took like, 33 pointers against Purdue, which partly is because of a Zach Eady presence, but also just because that's what they're so used to doing, and they were not effective in that front. And yeah, they've become far more effective. They're far more effective inside the paint. That's why I think. Uh, in that USF game the other night, uh, they were they shot seventy four percent from in, from two point range. Uh, so when you're shooting that effectively, like yeah, like that's where you should be. You should be living uh, in the paint and inside inside the arc. So on the so looking at the other team that is a WCC lock for the NCAA tournament, St. Mary's. This team, obviously, we know the injury to Josh Jefferson has been has been a bit of a is a blow and kind of Im- impacts what their ceiling probably is going into the tournament. You do have the the injury to Harry Wessels as well, but who knows how long he's going to be out. What what have you maybe seen like from them the last couple of weeks? We've seen them struggle a little bit more against USF. They dropped the game to Gonzaga. Are we are we starting to see more of that impact of the loss of Jefferson and maybe what what could they potentially do with the pieces they do have to try to counteract it? Well, yeah, I, I think the Jefferson injury hurts quite a bit. It's put a load on, on Alex Dukas's shoulders, particularly, you know, him playing 38 minutes the other night. He's never been a 38 minutes guy. Um, and, you know, Jefferson himself, I think the other key to this is he was really coming into his own and really shining. You know, you and I were both at the game against San Francisco when he couldn't miss and was really playing at a very high, confident level. Um, at that point in the season, it's really a shame that he went down. Um, but I think Augustus Marcellonis has really stepped up throughout the year as not only the facilitator and um, the the leader here, but also the, the the main ball defender on the other team's best player, much like you know the Logan Johnson role, as we like to say. Um, so that's been that's been really key. I think you know I think what is going to ultimately be the key is you know Ken Mitchell Saxon do anything to slow down Graham E.K. or is Graham E.K. just so superior athletically that there's nothing he can do? You know, that's that's really what it comes down to because Harry Wessels, as you we talked about before we came on, he's banged up. He'll be questionable for this tournament. But even so, I've noticed Randy Bennett, and especially in more important games, which both games ideally for St. Mary's that they'll make it to the championship game. Um, he's I don't know if uh, Bennett fully tr- trusts him yet. Maybe in the first half a little bit, but in the in the really key moments, uh, I think it's going to be mainly Saxon out there unless he's in foul trouble. Um, so you know, and you're looking for a little bit more out of Mason Forbes. He he kind of struggled in that Gonzaga game uh, of late, and it, yeah, and overall in the last two weeks, they've uh, outside of Gonzaga, they've mainly played teams that they can bulldog, um, you know, opposition wise. But but the, these are the games that really show their true colors. I. You know, and what we've talked about on other shows together is Randy Bennett will be extremely prepared and have these guys locked in for their semifinal game. Uh, but the challenge is most likely turning around and then having to play probably Gonzaga and what we know is virtually a road game down there at the Orleans Casino. So, <laughs> yeah, and I think yeah, and I think for the for the um, NCAA tournament, they will be an NCAA tournament team, same format as last year really prepared in that win last year against VCU turn around for second round. They actually were right there with UConn before the Dukas injury. And then that game got away from them, but you know, will they be able to turn around and be prepared with a shorthanded team uh, in that event? And is St. Mary's fans okay with, you know, just getting to the second round every year? Maybe they are. Uh, but it, I think, I think, I think everybody would love to see them get to the second weekend. And I just, I'm still kind of seeing the same roadblocks as before. Yeah, it's like the the ceiling does become that much more challenging. It does feel like if they had Jefferson, that I think you with the right matchup, yeah, they could end up they could have ended up in the second weekend. But with the injuries, it does seem that that it becomes that much more of a challenge, especially if you end up playing a bigger team 
um, in that second round, and that and one that's going to really challenge Saxon because without if you don't have Jefferson, you don't have, uh, and if you don't have Harry Wessels at that point, you become very thin on the post, and yeah. then his foul trouble becomes that much more highlighted. So for Vegas, um, we you talked you talked a little bit about the NCAA tournament and where these uh, this, and we can talk a little bit about the seeding. So what for these two teams we. Ass- there's almost the assumption that obviously it's going to be Gonzaga St. Mary's in the title game because it's very rare <laughs> when it's not Gonzaga St. Mary's in the title game. It's crazy. What are, what is the kind of the ceiling seed wise for both of these squads, and maybe what's the floor for both of them if they assume both get to the title game? What where can Gonzaga get to? Where can St. Mary's get to? And what's the floor? Yeah. So for St. Mary's, you know, one of the amazing things about their resume is they finished the year undefeated in true road games. They're the only team in the country that did that. And they, they've been the only team undefeated in true road games for over a month now. Um, so because they got that win at the kennel past all the other WCC tests with flying colors, I might add, you know, I think that upholds St. Mary's resume past a certain floor. I mean, that's really good for their floor. Of course, we know they took the lopsided uh, ugly Q3 losses at home to both Missouri State and Weber State. Can't get rid of those. So I think that limits their ability to be able to get into all the way up to a protected seed. And of course, the maximum St. Mary's can do from here is a semifinal win against um, Santa Clara, who on a neutral court is borderline quad two, quad three. Won't move the needle too much in this area of the seeding. And then, of course, a win over Gonzaga certainly helps. And the best thing about the WCC tournament from a selection committee standpoint is it's all done by Tuesday night. Their first meetings begin the following morning, Wednesday. So all of the uh, results that happen in this tournament are factored into the evaluation. That's not true for um, several of the power conference teams that they're compared against. In fact, all the power conference teams don't start until, you know, either that Tuesday or Wednesday. So almost any results they have there's limited weight on on those. And that's that's unfortunate from the process, but it is a little bit of an advantage for the WCC. Um, so the, the league can embrace that a little bit. Um, so I will say St. Mary's was a six seed for me yesterday. That Not much has changed since then. Uh, we, we saw last night, in fact, uh, a couple teams, you know, a little bit farther b- below them, like a Florida beat Alabama. Uh, Nevada got a big win at Utah State. So perhaps those two teams are in the same mix as St. Mary's now. Um, And we saw some other teams like Auburn and Alabama above them. Uh, Auburn got the win, sorry, but Alabama took a a loss on that Florida loss. We saw San Diego State lose, is who I was going to mention, at UNLV. But I think those teams are still clearly above St. Mary's, plus San Diego State has a a win against them, of course, back in the Vegas tournament. Um, So there's just getting compared to some of these teams, and St. Mary's a little bit of a unicorn with the – limited sample size, amazing net, not so great resume metrics. So I think six is still about where they probably will land. But of course, you know, ceiling wise, I'll say five. And I don't, I don't really see them dropping below a seven. So their six just feels like the sweet spot. Um, For Gonzaga, they're probably the more, the more polarizing team anywhere you'll find in the country, just based on the fact that they hadn't beaten anybody until the Kentucky game that was near the NCAA field, unfortunately for the Bulldogs in their non-conference games before that. The wins against USC, UCLA, Syracuse in normal years would all carry a lot of water. Um, The two LA schools had pretty much historically bad years for their their standards. And then Syracuse uh, floated around as a bubble team for a little bit, was never seriously uh, an NCAA team. And of course, last night's loss by them pretty much permanently makes it so Syracuse won't be in NCAA. So Gonzaga had to have that Kentucky win just so they can feel at least com- comfortable that they beat somebody in non-league. That's a clear tournament team. And even better news for Gonzaga since then is Kentucky's been on fire. That's actually helping that win even further. Uh, and then Gonzaga themselves having the biggest week of conference play last week, going and thumping San Francisco in the Chase Center counts as a true road win and thumping St. Mary's for the most part by double digits uh, at St. Mary's is uh, beyond what we thought maybe before the week started was possible. And it really kind of just clears up any kind of bubble concerns. So that's gone now. And now it's a seeding discussion about Gonzaga. And the other interesting thing is one of the key resume metrics is uh, the strength resume. 
and that skyrocketed as well with, you know, now they have three really good road wins. The, the three I just mentioned with Kentucky, St. Mary's and San Francisco, that shot up to a top 22 team. So they're 22nd in that metric right now. So now there's really nothing holding them back from elevating up the seed list. It's very rare for a team to do this this late in the year, but because Gonzaga was still needing more data, it was possible for a school like them. Um, and they, they shot up to a seven seed and uh, they, they could certainly still get to a six. A five seems a little too high based on, you know, there's still this six and six in the top two quadrants. So let's say another San Francisco went in the semifinals, a St. Mary's went in the finals. They're still just eight and six. Um, you know, I, I suppose five is possible because the committee process is you're voting on teams uh, in clusters and, and perhaps with the right vote, they get up to a five seed. But I, I probably won't project them higher than a six. But I, I feel solid that they'll be a six if they win this tournament. It, it was the is the the potential Gonzaga St. Mary's title game, the the flip flop for these two teams. The winner gets a six seed. The loser gets a seven. <laughs> if it's a blowout, maybe. I, I can see it if it's a good game, they both just get a six. So, yeah, that's that'll be interesting. But you can always, we can always talk again Tuesday morning because we both know a lot will change between now and then across the, the landscape. Right. And so going in now, talking about the WC tournament, we talked about how more than likely it's going to be Gonzaga St. Mary's in that title game because it's very rare when it hasn't been. The only other team to enter that since they moved to the tournament to Vegas was BYU. Yeah. Is there some? Is there anybody else who could actually win this tournament? Is is it possible that one of the others can actually get on a run, get hot, and and shock everybody and get an auto bid? I, I think it's just, quite frankly, down to Santa Clara and San Francisco to be realistic. Uh, they're the only two other teams playing like top one hundred teams. You know, if you filter by the last month or so in performance. You know, Santa Clara is around 85th in the country. San Francisco is around 75th in the country. I think that's really fair anyway for probably how good they are. Um, and, you know, with St. Mary's and Santa Clara, they've had some good battles. St. Mary's embarrassed them down there on a good spot schedule-wise um, at the beginning of the year. But Saint, Santa Clara came up here in the in the Bay Area and played St. Mary's tough. Um, and Saint, Santa Clara had a um, momentum-building win to end the year to beat the Dons. Uh, that's that's a heated rivalry there uh, that keeps escalating each time they play. So I think they'll come in feeling confident. They, of course, have to win late Saturday night in order to play St. Mary's on Monday night. Let's just assume they do. Um, you know, it, they need to get Adama Ball going. We'll talk about him more in a minute. Uh, but he's come back from injury. He hasn't fully looked himself or performed like his previous self. Uh, that will be a really big key. But I, I don't see it impossible for, for Santa Clara to win that. And, we, and we've seen really good semifinals between these two, you know, in, in years past. So uh, Broncos are thirsty to get over that hump. I just don't know if they can overcome just how prepared St. Mary's will be. You know, going into this tournament, St. Mary's has like nine days off. It's uh, it's it's like giving Randy Bennett his secret formula at times 100. Um, so <laughs> it's really, it, it, I won't pick against St. Mary's, but I, I, I can't say it's impossible. On the flip side, you have San Francisco, Gonzaga in a potential matchup as well. Um, San Francisco off to beat the winner of Portland and LMU, which uh, they were they were fine against those two teams this year. A little bit of a struggle at Portland, but um, I fully expect the Dons to be able to bounce back uh, against one of those two. And the thing I go back to is when the Dons played Gonzaga in the kennel, that wasn't that long ago, about a month ago. Um, game was tied with about four minutes to go, and they played really, really hard, had a great game plan, and then just couldn't get shots to fall, some things when it gets them officiating-wise as well, and end up losing that game. But the Dons battled so hard in the kennel. Um, and I think the thing is, is if they can somehow figure out a game plan to get Gonzaga out of their comfort zone with the things they did well last week, get them more of a jump-shooting team, that can make Gonzaga vulnerable. You know, their their shooting percentage was 71% from two in that game that got away from them at the Chase Center. Um, you know, you probably watched it, Zach. Four minutes to go in the first half. Game was uh, basically tied. And then Gonzaga goes on like a 19-3 run to start the second half. They ended the uh, first half on a big run to to close the gap there. So, yeah, I think, I think San Francisco 
you know, they they go back and watch those two games on film, they're going to say, hey, we can hang with these guys and maybe come out with a game plan. So that, that might be the one to watch. But, again, I can't predict it because now Gonzaga is infinitely confident, and they figured out a bunch of stuff that, that's working well for them. And, and, it, and like we know, these are home games for Gonzaga in, in Las Vegas with all the fans that come down. Yeah, Spokane South will be rocking and it will be a challenge for any for for USF and obviously like any every WCC team knows what the scenario is going to be with the crowd, especially when uh, they're playing Gonzaga. So as we're going into Vegas, there's a slew of guys who have kind of broken out during this tournament. Who are some of the guys that you have kind of keyed in on who might be players to watch? and might have some of those like really key performances in this tournament. Yeah, I think the tournament starts and stops with Andrew Nemhard. He's a guy playing basically all four. Ryan. All four. Ryan. <laughs> Why did I say Andrew? Where am I? <laughs> yeah, it's, I apologize. I came from a, a whack call right before this. Um, <laughs> my head was in whack land for a second. No, I'm sorry. Ryan Nemhard. Yes, of course. Sorry, Ryan. We love you. Um, Ryan nemhard has been the key. Played all 40 minutes in the St. Mary's game, obviously. He barely sits, and he's just playing at such an elite level, as I mentioned earlier. Um, and he's the he's the straw that stirs the drink. He's perhaps playing as the best point guard right now in the nation. That's certainly debatable, but my goodness. like The, the value he has to this team is immeasurable with only seven people that play and distributing the ball, finding, finding EK on their – uh, two two man game and also you know Watson and getting Hickman looks and you know the whole way the system works is all through him. Um, they play so many actions through him as well. Mark Few Mark Few talked a lot about that in the post game show uh, on Saturday night. And I mean he's really the key, uh, most important player in the tournament because if they if he doesn't miss a beat, there there's no way Gonzaga is going to lose. I don't think. Um, on the flip side for St. Mary's, I feel like Mitchell Saxon defensively trying to figure out a way to stop EK and maybe help on Watson without committing fouls is probably some of their key. I would also say for St. Mary's, uh, the ball handling, especially if Gonzaga applies that pressure again, is the key. Um, will they be able to handle it? That's a different topic, I guess. I, cause it's hard, hard to see that going very well for them after the last two times Gonzaga played that way. Um, so we'll, we'll see there, but I think, uh, Marshall Onus, of course, is a key, key player from that perspective. Uh, so th- those three players pop out for Santa Clara, Adama ball. Can he come back to his former self? He hasn't shown that quite yet on a consistent basis since returning from injury. Um, so I have my concerns there, but if Adama ball and Carlos Marshall can become that one, two punch, their, their bigs with Tilly and Fafaro can, can plug the middle. They actually have a lot of. Uh, dynamic options suddenly uh, that can help them compete to maybe make a run to the, uh, to the title game and surprise everybody. Uh, And from San Francisco's perspective, uh, it's Mogbo. He's been shut down by both of the big teams, Gonzaga and St. Mary's to a degree, making him uh, mostly ineffective compared to the numbers he puts up against the rest of the WCC. Um, And I think for, for him to really do his thing, uh, Guys like Malik Thomas and Ryan Beasley and Marcus Williams all need to figure out ways to get him uh, act, uh, in, involved early and often. Um, but I don't, I don't know if we're going to see that or not because San Francisco's really struggled to uh, to do that in the bigger games. And last but not least, uh, I got to throw in Mr. Ajayi from Pepperdine. Pepperdine playing in the very early round. Uh, but if one team's going to like make any kind of noise uh, from those early rounds, I think it's them. Lorenzo Romar has already been uh, terminated, but he will coach in the tournament. And I think that could be a rah-rah story. Pepperdine's got probably the most upside of any of the the bottom seeds from five through nine. And they'll start with Pacific. If they win that, they'll get San Diego. So certainly can win those two games. And Ajayi's just been a a beast. Javon Porter uh, is healthy, playing playing a little bit better lately. Um, You also, of course, have Houston Millette. Might be one of those WCC snubs we'll talk about in a second. But, yeah, um, just as a fun player to watch, Ajayi's kind of come out of the Juco ranks, had a great year, and, you know, these games will be on TV. Fun player to watch, you know, for the overall tournament. 
Yeah, there's going to be it, there's going to be a ton of guys I think to watch out. I'll add Deuce Turner to that grouping as yeah, well. Yeah, he's great. That he, I mean, he's been amazing for San Diego. That team is is a fun one to watch and like a very fascinating team. Steve Lavin's done, I think, a great job with with them this year. Uh, so we, as we kind of transition into like the the WCC awards, there was a lot of chatter on Twitter yesterday about uh, the the lack of Zags for the individual awards. Uh, the top six awards, I should say. Uh, what was your initial reactions? Did you what what sort of kind of changes did you have? What what did you who did you have on your list that maybe was different from what the coaches ended up with? I think in general, you know, they decided to give three to each of the top two teams uh, with Ek, Nemhard, Watson, uh, and then um, for St. Mary's Mahaney, Marshallonis, and Saxon. I think Mahaney was even debatable because he he had his ups and downs throughout the year, um, but I you know it, 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 it's crazy to have a ten man team in a nine team league like <laughs> yeah. so I guess that's my first beef uh, before we <laughs> go anywhere else, uh, but yeah like obviously uh, guys like Hickman and so forth probably should have been first team with that many spots. Um, Marcus Williams and Mogbo got in from San Francisco. I I think they're both pretty worthy. Uh, Mar- Marcus Williams, when he's on, had a great year. But I also thought Malik Thomas was in a lot of games equally as as valuable, um, and he just made honorable mention. So, um, so yeah, and I think with the player of the year going uh, going to Marshallona is great for him, and St. Mary's did win the league, so there's your justification. Uh, and I think the awards were submitted maybe a bit early. Uh, before the last most important game of the year. <laughs> and I think a lot of people would have switched their votes if that's the case to Ryan Nemhart, right? Um, or EK even. So it just depends. It, it, was a, it was a wild year because Gonzaga was underperforming for a lot of it, uh, had the loss to Santa Clara for Gonzaga standards, right? Right. And, and, you know, in February, they've been back to their lights out reputation. Uh, but the whole season matters. And so I don't really, I don't know. The awards thing we can debate forever. I think awards are there to, to be debated. Um, so obviously if we're going off the last month, Gonzaga should have cleaned house. But for the whole body of work of the year, I thought the awards were pretty fair. Yeah, and it's like it was one of those, like, I I kind of, like, I was a little curious on the on the player of the year because, yeah, Graham E.K. the last month has just been an absolute monster, and he's yeah. been clearly the best player in the league. Um, and the newcomer, that was another one where it's like, well, it's like, at least in my mind, it's like, if it was, if EK is the player of the year, well, he's then also the newcomer of the year. It's like that kind of like you check one box, you check the other as that newcomer. And if, and Mobo, I, I really love Mobo's game all year long. I think he was exactly what USF had been missing a year ago. They needed that inside presence. Um, it just seemed to because I kind of would have slotted him on the defensive player of the year. So I would have kind of like moved him over and like right. had, and had EK there as a newcomer or even Ryan Nemhard, who has had a great year. Uh, but yeah, you can debate this for, for a long time. And there's been plenty of debate and probably still plenty of debate happening on, on Twitter right now about all of these awards and how uh, this is maybe going to motivate Gonzaga even more because none of their guys got those top awards. Yeah, it's fair. And Gonzaga's got a million, you know, f- websites and a million fans, right? So they need stuff to talk about. So yeah. this is good chatter for everybody. And we, they've got a week to kill before we start, <laughs> before they take the court again. Um, so yeah, we'll probably be hearing a lot about it. <laughs> yeah, for sure. All right. <laughs> Thanks, Rocco, for hopping on. It's always great to talk to you. Uh, be sure to follow. Rocco on Twitter at Rocco Miller eight, and then check out the bracketeer.org as well. Um, Rocco, thanks for hopping on. It's always great to chat. I will see you in Vegas in just a few days. My pleasure. Uh, always good to talk to you, Zach. I'm pumped to see you in Vegas. I just can't believe it's already championship week here in the small leagues and we're rolling right into uh, the WCC tournament here in just a couple nights. It's uh, it always comes way too fast. I feel like it was just preseason like yesterday. Um, but anyway, always great to be on with you and look forward to seeing you in uh, Las Vegas. See you there.